The only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. Well, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Richard Panic on the uh, on the program on the Into the Impossible podcast, which is a uh, a production of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at the University of California, San Diego. So, Richard, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the with the Center for Human Imagination, but it's sort of the place where you would feel right at home because we really Im- explore the interstices between science, uh, arts writing science fiction oh. science fact and really uh, in many ways all thanks to sort of the visionary pathway set by our founding namesake uh, sir yeah. arthur c clark who was of course a polymath uh, who capable of exploring deep deep conversations in the uh, in the in the you know predictions about the future to actually creating scientific uh, concepts and, and obviously science mm-hmm. science fiction as well uh, it's hard to believe we're you know almost uh, uh, you know 19 years past the the, t- the t- 2001 space odyssey which inspired many of us to think right. both about space exploration and to and to think about uh, the universe around us but uh, so I'd like to begin first with a uh, with a question to you as someone who's written many books uh ranging from uh books written with your uh with your co-author um, temple grandin uh, right. all the way to uh the books written by yourself alone about about physics and astrophysics in particular and, and gravity and cosmology uh, yeah. what inspires you as as an author as a writer uh to get into science you're not a scientist by background what right. inspired you to, to take that sort of leap into very, I think, very, you know, both neuroscience uh, as well as in the physical sciences. What made you take that leap, and and were you scared at first? Great question. Uh, yes, I was scared at first. Uh, as you said, I don't have a background in science, uh, and an editor uh, used to approach me in the mid '90s about, did I want to write a book about this or a book about that? She liked my my writing, I guess. And I turned her down several times, even though I wanted to write a book, I just felt that there was no, you know, there was no, no match there. I mean, I don't know if you remember the uh, Republican governor of New York, George Pataki, but she asked me if I wanted to ghostwrite his memoir. I was like, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, And she she asked me once if I wanted to write a book about the telescope. And I was kind of like, no, 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 no. (laughs) Uh, Because I knew nothing about it. I had no background in science. Uh, and I and she said, you know, I and I said to her, I said, you know, the thought of researching a piece of technology for seven years and five hundred footnotes, and she said, no, 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 think of it as an essay. Take a month. Mm-hmm. So I took a month and I and I read up on it and I and I thought, oh, this is really about history and philosophy. That's fascinating, and I can get the college education. I was too stupid. <laughs> to enjoy, to appreciate at the time, um, and I wouldn't have any uh, any college loans either. So that so that was <laughs> uh, so that's how I got into it, and it just it, it just you know it just fell on my lap, and I and I just haven't looked back, and that was you know that was uh, more than twenty years ago. Wow, and uh, and it's it's nice to know for you know for Governor Cuomo that you might uh, still be available, perhaps to uh, help him ghostwrite a biography, and perhaps uh, if it didn't work for Pataki, who, who knows it could work for Cuomo. Um, so I, I really uh, enjoyed your book. Uh, you were kind enough to send it to me for free, and uh, and uh, and you still owe me a signature. You're going to give that to me someday okay. meet in person. Uh, but I like it so much. I bought it on audiobook because I wanted to hear sort of the narrative story told because it's really an adventure story. And I, I like to just in full disclosure, I like to point out to my uh, listeners when does it you know when is it okay to buy a book in Kindle. Uh, when is it okay to buy a book in audio form? Like, will you be missing anything? And 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 I think in this book there are no illustrations. So for those of us who like to listen to audio books, um, they won't miss out on any on any illustrations as some books have. Um, not all books have to have it. And and it um, it really is an adventure story. So I think it, it lends itself 
both you know to Kindle, but but certainly to the audiobook format that I uh, listened to it in originally, and then went back to read over several passages in the hardcover. So it's um, and, and my style when I talk to authors such as yourself, <clears throat> I don't like to really talk too much about the book itself. Mm-hmm. I don't like it when authors are forced to divulge the contents of the book and 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 really undercut you know what, what is our bread and butter, uh, how we make our <laughs> living for some of us, right? So um, we'll talk about some of the themes of the book, but I want okay. listeners to really get into it. The one thing I do want to point out is I love the the organization of the book. It's very logically uh, structured. And what I like about it is that each of the uh, of the chapters begins with the word gravity. And, uh, and the, you know, it's really the overall, although the subject is the trouble with gravity, I thought it was sort of, in some sense, um, you know, a natural sequel, if you will, to the 4% universe, which you wrote yeah. back in 2011, mm-hmm. in that, uh, that book is about the four percent of the universe that we're sort of familiar with, namely the protons, neutrons, you know, croutons that we are all made of, <laughs> some more than others. And in the case of of gravity, gravity has this mysterious nature, which it interacts, as you describe, in a visceral, physical sense. You know, one of your chapters is gravity in our bones, mm-hmm. uh, very evocative, and uh, and the nature of how we encounter gravity. But it is a mysterious. It's not. It's immaterial. The force of gravity is immaterial, and you describe the latest current thinking on it and li- lest le- readers be left uh, both you know really not well um, uh, I would say not warned not forewarned we really don't come away with an answer as to what is gravity and I think mm-hmm. that's what's so great about the book and its title it's not saying what is gravity what uh, there are a lot of books out about you know what is the nature of reality what is you know what is the nature of the origin of the universe and I think fundamentally the question that I grappled with continuing to read this book, uh, and the honesty is very refreshing, that we don't know, and even the greatest minds, the, what made them so great, like Einstein, as you describe it, what made him so great is that he knew what he did not know. Right. And he knew he got close to things. They delighted him. They gave him the greatest thrills of his life, as he said, but he still didn't have a notion of the essence. I want to ask you, after writing The 4% Universe and after writing The Trouble with Gravity, um, do you feel like all of science is basically unknown and, and, and that we don't really have a visceral, we'll never have the visceral sense that our classical minds want to have? Or did you come away with the, with the hope that perhaps we could understand one of the four forces or some of the aspects of physics or cosmology and actually have a true understanding that we'd say we understand it? Do you think that, that that's something you come away with? Or do you think it's still as great a mystery as ever, both both matter and and um, and energy in the form and, and gravity. Well, first of all, I w- want to go back to what you were saying about uh, the book being upfront about that we don't know what gravity is. And that was important to me. And I put it in the introduction so that readers wouldn't keep going through and saying, okay, now we're going to find out. Right. Uh, and, I, and, and I love that, uh, and this is also a way of answering your major question, I love the idea of not knowing things. So I was very attracted to uh, dark matter and dark energy and 4% universe because uh, it just blew my mind that that we didn't know what most of the universe was made of and that all the astronomy we've been doing forever uh, was based on an incorrect assumption, <laughs> a natural assumption, but an incorrect one. And then when I realized that we don't know what gravity is, I thought, well, there's, there's something there too, because we don't, um, we just, you know, we take it for granted. And, and, you know, and with good reason there, you know, with good reason, we thought that astronomy was the, uh, was the science of the visible universe, um, because what else were we going to think? And, uh, and the same thing with, with gravity. And, and I found a lot in researching the book that when I would tell people, um, you know, we don't know what gravity is. People who weren't scientists would say, well, what do you mean? We do, we do know what it is. If I let go of this thing, it'll fall and so on. And, uh, but when I would say to physicists, they would say, yeah, that's right. We don't know what it is. Uh, and I, and I just love that, that, that disconnect, you know, between what our common assumptions are and what, uh, what's really out there. So do I, do I think you're asking, do I think that we're, that we're ever going to know what dark matter, dark energy and, uh, and gravity are, is that your question? Yeah. Do you think we're on, like, there is a hope for that? I mean, I guess there's always a hope, but is there a chance that we would understand it? Well, I think there's probably a better chance with, uh, with dark matter if 
if they discover, for instance, the axion, which is one of the candidate hypothetical particles. If they discover that, then, okay, we know what dark matter is. Dark energy is a different kind of beast. It's, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't match with quantum mechanics. It's one of those areas where general relativity and quantum mechanics don't meet. So that's mm -hmm. much more challenging. And gravity, uh, you know, I guess it's it's kind of contingent on whether um, they find the quantum equivalent. Again, we're in, into the quantum world. Uh, if they find the quantum uh, equivalent particle, uh, which you know has been provisionally call, called called uh, the graviton, but it you know it hasn't it hasn't fallen out of the observations at uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. I had a conversation a few weeks ago on the Into the Impossible podcast with uh, Dr. Sean Carroll of Caltech, oh, yes. who, who, of course, has a recent uh, book called um, Something Something Deeply Hidden, which is also a quote from Albert Einstein mm -hmm. about the nature of, of reality and uh, so-called many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And listeners can find links to that uh, on our on our various websites and places where we uh, you'll find our podcast. But uh, but ultimately, Ultimately, what Sean is taking the approach of is, is really not trying to take gravity and quantize it, as we did with electromagnetism, but really find, you know, find gravity within quantum mechanics itself. Mm -hmm. So find the origin of, of what we perceive as gravitational force and gravitational energy and so forth associated with gravitational properties by looking at the nature, the fundamental nature of what quantum mechanics is. And how um, and how we are able to really, in some sense, in his interpretation, you know, find find uh, venues or, or aspects of entropy, of uh, connections to you know black hole physics, etc., that really could cause gravity to emerge from quantum mechanics rather mm -hmm. than the other way around. So mm -hmm. it's not at all clear to people like Sean, and I'm agnostic on this, uh, but it's not at all clear to people like Sean, like as if we if we'll ever be able to quantize it. But I yeah. guess I guess getting back to my earlier question, uh -huh. um, which you which you mostly answered, but you know, in part, it's let, let's say we do quantize gravity, and we have a good uh, a good explanation for uh, we have a good quantum theory of electrodynamics. In fact, that's called quantum electrodynamics, and in some sense, it's the paradigm for all different attempts to quantize the forces of nature. And the other three forces do have quantum field theoretic descriptions. But uh, but would you say, in your opinion, I mean, do we really understand them? Because we can say there is a photon, do we, do we understand electromagnetism even more? I, I recall a story uh, that Richard Feynman told in one of his, you know, he's the only guy I know who can write, you know, multiple autobiographies. But uh, in one of them, he said, you know, after he won the Nobel Prize for QED, quantum electrodynamics, he talked to his father, who was just a simple, you know, scientifically literate, but not an expert <clears throat> uh, there in, in New York, not far from where you are, I believe. And he said uh, to his, his father, said to him, so, son, you know, now you won the Nobel Prize and everything. Um, you know, can you explain something to me when an electron makes a transition from a higher energy orbital to a lower energy orbital, it emits a photon? And, and, and Feynman said, that's right. And, and then his dad said, uh, something to the effect of, so was the photon stored inside the electron all this time? Mm. And Feynman said, I didn't know, and I said I didn't know. Uh, and, and his dad looked at him with a look of, of dismay and disapproval and disappointment, the likes of which he had never seen. You know, he had held his son up as his great uh -huh. gene, and he couldn't answer the most simple question. So are we destined always to really lack the the either the linguistic skills or or the ability as humans? Are we asking the wrong question to really say, do we understand gravity as, yeah. as, it, as it is a big thesis of your book? I'm glad to hear you asking the question because that's the kind of question I wanted readers to come away from the book with, you know, to be, to be challenging these fundamental, you know, these fundamental uh, questions, to be asking them and uh, challenging the fundamental assumptions. In, in reading the book, I do feel like you're, you're, and you've, you've had this, I haven't read all of your other books, but, <clears throat> but, I come away with a sense of, of you sort of being a tour guide. And, and literally in the book, in some of my favorite episodes, you take us to Italy, you take us around the world, you take us into these intimate conversations with scientists and lay people and even historical figures uh, going back in time and imagining uh, kind of conversations. And I see this as a tour guide. And, and I maybe was thinking as I was coming away from the book, feeling that 
just like a tour guide, you can't make me understand Italian just because you take me to, uh, you know, the, the, the coast of, of Italy. Uh, but, but you can uh, give me the flavor of it. And I feel like you, did, you do give the flavor not only of, you know, kind of a tourist, but even for professionals such as myself who do wrestle with it. And you interview many eminent, eminent physicists in the book. Um, but what, what does it really mean to understand? And what does it say it mean to, to know? You act as this consummate tour guide. And I think that's what impels the reader along in this journey. And I think, you know, just personally, I don't want to insert things into, into, your, uh, into your words, but, but that we can't, we want to know. But when we say we want to know, what we really mean is we want to have a classical understanding right. of things. Like we can't understand quantum mechanics because we're not at the level of, you know, 10 to the minus 13, uh, you know, millimeter, uh, centimeters. Uh, but similarly, so we want to have a classic and our classical intuition fails us. Ironically, gravity is the theory perhaps we have the greatest access to classical experimentation. In fact, the way that you got into this field or into this book was through doing um, – an experiment in gravity, so to speak, uh, where you encountered uh, you enter- encountered gravity. We normally think of it as the weakest forces, and and you literally fell over in a bookstore, uh, as we are rec- as you recount, and that encounter with gravity. And in a bookstore, I can't help but think that those are, you know, I don't think you hit your head. I think, no. I think you, uh, you, 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 uh, this, this, uh, this encounter really impelled you to want to learn more. But I think, uh, ironically, we have this classical understanding of gravity that couldn't be better, as you talk about in the book. We don't need quantum gravity to send an Apollo spacecraft no. or Orion spacecraft to the moon. So I think, um, Maybe it's it's like as Sean is saying, you know, we're trying to get uh, quantized gravity, but maybe we should be looking for the, you know, gravity within quantum mechanics. Maybe we're trying to understand gravity, but we should look for, you know, the gravitational understanding and, and our, our experience of classical everyday life. Niels Bohr, who wrote a lot uh, about the philosophy of science, really. I mean, he had several um, several collections of essays out, and over the years, they got progressively more philosophical. And he was mm-hmm. he was of the opinion that we that we that because we came of age intellectually in a classical environment, our language and our brains didn't develop to mm-hmm. understand quantum mechanics, and so we we just might not be able. You know, to go back to your question, like, can we understand it? Maybe the answer is, is no, because that's just not the way that 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 we operate, and we don't have the language for it. Did you encounter? So you've written, you know, and again, you're you're such an intellectually peripatetic author and intellectual. I mean, you've written this book with with uh, Temple Grandin, who's one mm-hmm. of the foremost, you know, kind of. Um, uh, public figures who is uh, who I believe she has autism or is a mm-hmm. is, uh, uh, <clears throat> has, has been dealing with that. So you wrote a book called The Autistic Brain with her, and mm-hmm. you know there. I wonder if you came across throughout the you know explorations either in the four percent universe or in the trouble with gravity. Do you, did you come across? You know this this notion to want. I, I, my understanding, which is very limited of autism, is that there is oftentimes a frustration and inability to perceive the sense of self, the the theory of identity, um, both by people who have autism of other people, the theory of others um, of self perception, but also of others to perceive them. And I wonder. In your encounters, at least with scientists, are there commonalities between you know the two kind of very physics-heavy books, or not? Not you know, there's no equations, yeah, yeah. but 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 in terms of the the phenomena that you're describing and the autistic brain, are there commonalities between some of the scientific characteristics of a great scientist um, and 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 folks like Temple and, and others, um, or, or or are there commonalities in the way that they interact with the world that you see, or am I you know, off base there? Uh, not, I mean, you, I, I don't, I don't think that I've encountered among scientists. I don't think I've encountered it, it, um, you know, spectrum, you know, whatever you want to call it, autism being on the spectrum any, any more than I, uh, encounter it in other fields, other parts of life. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, you meet, you meet people and you go, okay, yeah, that's, that's probably, you know, that might explain some things, but, uh, but, but no, on the whole, no, sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, in the, um, <clears throat> in the interest of, you know, kind of understanding the process by which you 
go through in writing your book. So this is, um, so you wrote that book with, with Temple, mm-hmm. uh, Temple Grandin. Uh, what is that process like of working with a co-author versus working by yourself? I have very limited experience compared to you. And I think a lot of times our listeners are interested in the, in the creative process of revealing you know, either scientific or cultural or uh, creative pursuits. Mm-hmm. What's the, what's the diff- how did you experience those two different uh, paths to writing books? Uh, well, you know, when I, when I write about science, because I don't have a background in science, I, I try to use that ignorance on my part to, uh, in a positive way, because I feel like if I can educate myself about something, then I might be able to explain it to the reader in such a way that the reader might understand it. I mean, that I would have understood it before mm-hmm. I started thinking about whatever the topic is. Uh, and and I tell my students, I, my writing students, uh, I, I tell them to think about nonfiction as uh, inviting the reader to stand with you, kind of shoulder to shoulder, and you go, you know, and you go exploring together. So in my own work, I see myself standing with the scientists and asking really basic questions. And then you get answers and then it leads you down more complicated paths. And that's the model that I try to follow in my, in my book in structuring the book. And so with Temple, the same principle operated. I felt like, okay, I'm going to stand with her and understand this, whatever the process is. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then, and then I did, you know, research on my own and use that as part of the narrative as well. Um, you know, researching the the history of the diagnosis, for instance, uh, and um, you know, raising some again historical and philosophical questions about that. Uh, but and and in those sections of the book, I mean, that was me kind of you know inviting the reader to stand along with me. Um, but I got there by standing along with uh, Temple, just as I do with the some of the you know the the writers or the scientists uh who i you know i mean especially in the four percent universe which was mm-hmm. uh really a contemporary history of the of the discovery of these two phenomena uh, and uh, as well as the cosmic microwave background and just you know talking to the people who did the work and saying okay walk me through it what happened then what did what were you thinking what did you want to know what did you find out did that surprise you what questions did it raise and you know just by taking it down to this really fundamental basic level i find that you can um create a story out of these discoveries and the same thing with temple excellent Uh, thanks for that. Uh, we'll come back just at the very end to one creative question that I like to ask all my okay. all my podcast guests. But I want to talk a little bit about not not ex- again. I want uh, folks to read the book, buy the book, buy the many copies. Uh, makes a great uh, uh, depending on when you hear this, uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, Junior Day present or Valentine's Day present uh, or, or maybe even New Year's Eve if we're quick. Um, the Trouble with Gravity by Richard Panic, um, uh, who we're interviewing today. It's gotten uh, fabulous reviews. Kirkus, um, it was selected as one of Symmetry Magazine's Books of the Year of 2019, uh, which is which is rather outstanding because everybody else on the list is basically a professional physicist or you know a well you know well experienced scientist who is a popularizer of science. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, so, uh, in in the quest to understand gravity, um, which you pointed out something, you know, which I always love to do a little bits of trivia. And in, in my book, you know, one of the things I hear the most about is I didn't know that the word lens came from the lentil beans shape. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and then I thought about your book, and 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 really not knowing that Newton, you know, was sort of coining this term gravity uh, in a sense that hadn't been coined before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it has a connotation of the grave, right? So yeah. uh, one of the wonderful yeah. things about the book is a historical, um, you know, I called it, you know, in my in my notes on the book, you know, a brief history of gravity. But mm-hmm. It's not only etymological; it's it's sort of uh, you know ontological. You're on, you're exploring how has it been been actually 
perceive, but but also how how has it been experienced? Mm -hmm. So I, I and I love the fact that you start you really start from a very heavily religious perspective. You talk a lot about you know the, the in the context of Jesus and and even in the Old Testament, uh, how is this experienced? And I was curious because I, I don't know much. I heard an interview a podcast with you um, not too long ago, and I, I recall that you were raised Catholic. Uh, Big yeah. C, I think Catholic, um, uh, and so uh, can you tell us more about your uh, your pathway through faith, uh, and if that did that have an influence? Uh, there's a good you know chapter or two that 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 deals with that, not as an, in an overarching you know kind of yeah. overbearing way, I should say, but really in a almost a historical. Um, narrative of how how these people conceived of what is up there, heaven, hell, Dante. You know, you're right. you're one of the few writers who can bring up Dante and then you know throw in all these popular cultural references. So, anyway, getting back to the original part, first part of the question. Um, yeah, dealing with uh, how is the uh, does religion play a role in, in in this book or in 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 your life personally or? No, not in my not in my life so so much. Uh, I'm a very lapsed Catholic. I was raised Catholic, but, but long, long lapsed. Yeah. But uh, but you know, certainly there is that influence in me, that curiosity about religion. What I found in researching the book um, is that I started looking at creation myths. So I'm dealing when I'm when I'm dealing with religion, when I'm dealing with you know, Catholicism and things, I'm still looking at them for me in the context of mythology. What are the stories we tell ourselves about, about uh, our relationship to the universe? And we do that through, sometimes through religion and mythology. And I started looking at creation myths and I, I, on my own, I just kept reading them, thinking about how does this relate to gravity? Because uh, you used the phrase, you know, up there. And I use that heavily in the book, the difference between up there and down here. And that doesn't, wouldn't occur to us unless we were wedded to one of those two areas. And in researching uh, um, creation myths, I found that in almost every case, actually in every case that I came across, uh, they, they, they all begin with the separation of earth and sky. And it dawned on me that uh, that we wouldn't be making that separation unless we identified with one of those two areas and we saw them as distinct. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the area up there is mysterious. So we give it special qualities and we call them, uh, you know, gods on the mountains or in the clouds or whatever. Uh, and, and then we attribute certain other qualities to what is familiar to us and, and, uh, and what is mundane. And mundane comes from the Latin mundanus or of the earth. Right there, all right. Uh, and, and, the, and the grave, did, did you say that? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, yeah. so, so um, gravitas, heaviness, gravity, uh, they all have the same uh, associations. So I found... And then I came across a quote from this uh, um, scholar from the mid 20th century, who is, I guess, one of the one of the leading scholars on creation myths. Uh, and I quote this in the book. He's, yeah. He says that uh, he calls that division between uh, sky and earth uh, the primeval pair. And I thought, wow, okay, so I. It, like it occurred to me, and I pursued it, and then and and uh, and eventually I found this uh, validation for this idea that I had. So, uh, so you can see how in the creation myths, the beginnings of religion, it's already it's already there. How we see our relationship to the universe is right. down here, and we aspire to up there. And also, you know, I took away the, you know, this connection, this fun, these, these, these dichotomies that you start the book off with. I'll just read the beginning <clears throat> because it does start with the same, in, uh, you know, basic prologue as the you know, most famous book with the highest book sales. I always say, I just want 1% of God's book sales. Uh, right. You say, in the beginning were the heavens and the earth. You can look it up. Then came light and dark and with them day and night. Soon followed the beasts of the earth and the fowl of the air. 
<clears throat> what wasn't in the beginning, at least not explicitly, was whatever was creating this division. Still, that whatever was implicit in those binary distinctions. That whatever defined with the exactness of a razor, the most fundamental divide of all, the horizon. And the horizon becomes a sort of character, but also this, you know, the binary dichotomies up, down, you know, and, and then we see, you know, sky, earth, uh, and, and these in, in, the, in the beginnings, you know, and then that, that makes you think about the end, right? So there are all these dichotomies discussed in the book. Um, and um, and I think it is uh, it is sort of interesting. We even have it, you know, in our in popular language. We talk about uh, you know falling in love, and, and mm -hmm. what what are these emotions that you talk about those as well? And 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 what's very charming in the book is you don't you don't shy away from really saying that there was a relevancy. I mean, obviously the Bible's not a science book, but but really, you know, by starting it off with some sort of a no notion of foundation of divisions up here, down there, um, it, it 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 certainly inculcated a curiosity in people. And as, as you say in the book, you know, if there was beginning, this concept of the end and what that meant to folks like Dante and, you know, the end, is it a theological end? Is it a physical place within the earth? And then all the way up through um, to, the, to the scientific explicators of gravity, uh, starting with, with Galileo, who plays a huge role in your book, as well as my book, and Newton, uh, who is a really interesting character because he kind of combined those religious and the scientific sensibilities in a way that you know few before him or after him have. But it, but it's so interesting to look at all the great characters that you think about, uh, the greatest thinkers in history, and 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 they all can they all you know confronted gravity, and and here we are today still confronting it, maybe with more precise tests. And and I think it's a wonderful uh, uh, way to think about it. One one of the things that spoke to me as well uh, was that you mentioned not only the scientific and cultural aspects of gravity, but the political aspects, which was sort of a surprise to me. But then, you know, reading the book, you talk about John Locke and and his influence on, on the founding fathers uh, of America. I don't know. Can you say a, a few words about that? That was a unique uh, thesis that I had not really heard explored before. And, and uh, I want to come back to that after I hear how okay. did you find out about that? What was the uh, what was what's the role that that you know gravity plays in the founding of our country, so to speak? Okay, well, about twenty years ago, uh, I had a book, uh, the, the telescope book that I referred to earlier. Yeah. The book on the telescope was called Seeing and Believing, and in researching that book, I saw that okay, the invention of the telescope, which then Galileo takes and converts into a scientific instrument and opens up, you know all sorts of new understandings of the universe, uh, that that was the moment, that was the first instrument that extended one of the human senses, okay? It extends the sense of sight. And it, it, get, it put the ability to investigate the universe into the hands of the person who is doing the investigating. So it was, um, in that sense, it was a democratic uh, small d democratic uh invention in that it 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 removed or transferred some of the power from the distant king or pope or god or whatever uh and gave it to you because now you could hold it in your hand and you could see for yourself and you didn't have to take somebody else's word for it and you could repeat what other people saw. So this was, you know, it was the beginning of the scientific method, right? And the way that we think about science. Um, and, and that, in researching the book on, on uh, the telescope, uh, I, I saw that this democratic principle then, you know, it, did, it just, it, it kind of laid out logically that if you have this instrument in your hand, then you have more power and the power shifts and it, you know, as I said, and, uh, and eventually it leads to, uh, to, to some of the things that I quote in this book. Uh, so I've been thinking about this for, you know, for, for a couple of decades and, and it leads to some of the, you know, the observations in, in this book where the founding, uh, the founders of democracy, uh, we're we're thinking about, you know, what are the implications of the scientific method, and and how do we know, um, you know, are the stories in the Bible, which were assumed to be literally true, the New Testament stories, were were they uh, were they actually true? And I mentioned in the book that Thomas Jefferson uh, cut out, um, he he took the um, 
the New Testament, the Gospels in the New Testament, and he um, and he cut out all of the miracles and published that as mm-hmm. as the story of Jefferson Jesus. Bible, right? Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so you know, this is very much on their on their minds, um, mm-hmm. you know, and and giving take you know giving the power to the people. Yeah. So I, I came across an interesting connection to that as well over the over the summer. Uh, I forget what really prompted it, uh, but I was uh, looking at the works of, of Euclid, and throughout the works of Euclid, he talks about uh, sort of certain propositions being self-evident. And uh, in other words, I think I think there aren't so many things in Euclidean geometry that you can say are self-evident. But once he establishes some things, he then goes and says, by extension, you know, if this property holds, this holds true by axioms of logic, you know, that parallel lines don't meet or, or things mm-hmm. like that. And uh, and then later, of course, uh, Newton in the Principia picks that up as well, and he has the exact same language, you know, basically uh, copying from from Euclid and says that such and such is self-evident uh, as well. And then, of course, uh, folks like Thomas Jefferson, you find the exact same language uh, mm-hmm. coming into the Declaration of Independence and, and so mm-hmm. forth, and uh, the self-evidentiary nature of things, which is really, you know, not exactly, you know, part and parcel of the scientific method, right? You're not supposed to say, well, that's self-evident, because, you know, some yeah. people that might not be, you know, if you have <laughs> right. a heavier object, it seemed uh, self-evident right. you know, for millennia that they would fall faster than a, than a, uh, than a lighter object. Uh, but of course, that's not true. I think, uh, you know, I had a question as I'm reading it and I'm uh, thinking about this conversation that we're going to have. So if it's true that, uh, that things are self-evident and that's a way to prove things or at least motivate uh, certain assumptions being, uh, being provable, uh, then you know, and you talk about this in the book, how Einstein uh, took Euclidean geometry and really threw it away and established, uh, well, he, with, with the help of Lobachevsky and others, yeah. <clears throat> geometers, which you, you recount a story I didn't know, which is that he really didn't care so much about Euclidean or non-Euclidean geometry early in his life, and right. then it became the basis of the theory of general relativity. First, can you say something about what does it mean, non-Euclidean geometry? And then I'll ask the question about, well, if Euclid's wrong, then, you know, is anything really said to be self-evident? But first, can you say a little bit about Einstein and, and his encounters with non-Euclidean geometry? And what sure. Well, you, you just mentioned uh, Euclid's example of parallel lines always meet. Well, in non-Euclidean geometry, you can have a curved surface. I mean, you, you know, you look at a, a balloon or a ball. This has lines of longitude on it, lines of latitude on it, and they meet at the poles, but they're parallel at the equator, right? Uh, right. That's one example. That's not exactly what Einstein used it for, but yes. Right, uh, right. but he needed it for thinking about uh, curvature in space, uh, in space-time. Right. And so, uh, so, and that is the sort of modern, you know, as we teach it in our uh, cosmology classes, we talk about different possibilities for the so-called curvature of the universe, which would be manifest really only on its largest possible scales. I, I don't know if you know, but I wrote a book on Einstein and Freud about 15 years ago called wow. uh, The Invisible Century. And it's about how wow. they changed the way that we see science and the way we think about the invisible and or the non uh, tangible, mm. uh, and and uh, and so I, I I wrote a fair amount about um, general relativity in there and how you, you know how he um, how Einstein needed to incorporate non Euclidean geometry in that, but I can't I I wouldn't pretend that I understand it fully. Right. In fact, I had I had to uh, uh, for this book I had to really um, confront general relativity in a different you know, much more rigorous way. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was, um, that was difficult. (laughs) So one of the things that uh, one comes away with after reading the book is that, you know, sort of the lay person will assume that even if they don't know what gravity is, some scientist knows what it is. But it seems like the greater the scientist, the more perplexed and baffled they are with with gravity and how to mm-hmm. how to reconcile its its you know apparent simplicity you know inverse square law is something mm-hmm. you can teach to you know fourth graders um 
but but that you know really understanding its essence requires so much more and and you make the point repeatedly that the greater the scientists sort of the greater their acknowledgement of what they didn't know up until the very day when you encountered kip thorne so maybe you can uh, relate that story as well right so kip thorne was one of the people one of the uh, one, one of the people behind uh the ligo experiment that wound up uh detecting gravitational waves for the for the first time prediction that was kind of embedded in uh einstein's equations uh but nobody had observed them um and uh and and so kip was one of the people who put that uh experiment together that took decades to get rolling and i asked him once i i was on the phone with him for something unrelated to this and uh and i just thought okay i'll ask him what i'm asking everybody else i said well, so uh what is gravity and and he said well that's a meaningless question and that really became part of the impetus for this book i i, I recount that anecdote in the uh introduction to the book the preface and uh and i found myself thinking about that question a lot as i wrote the book and asking myself well what did i even mean by that you know what do you mean by what is gravity this goes back to the to the discussion we were having at the beginning of this of this conversation about you know how do you how do you define things what what is the meaning of something um so i had to really think hard about what i was what i must have thought i was asking him um, yeah yeah so the, the, yeah and it's, it's interesting you know it's a meaningless question but like a lot of meaningless questions i mean famously yeah. uh stephen hawking was said to have said you know asking what happened before the big bang is as nonsensical as asking what's north of the north pole mm -hmm. uh of course every kid will tell you it's santa claus and stuff yeah. like that. but um but in reality uh the you know the 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 notion of these very simple questions that are simple to ask but you know maybe impossible to answer i'm not sure you know if i agree with kip on that on that note i think it's incredibly meaningful it's just we may lack as i said yeah as we discussed earlier you know we may lack the you know vocabulary and the articulation to really under you know explain mm -hmm. it um but what is you know the detection of gravitational sure. waves if not the really crowning achievement of a theory that was predicted a hundred plus years ago uh by albert einstein and the consequences of which you know took so long and so much painstaking energy by kip and and the team of over a thousand people on LIGO and, and is still going on to this very day, <clears throat> this quest to understand the universe and see it in the same way that uh, that Galileo did. Of course, as you point out, you know, Galileo democratized the telescope, uh, although he was pretty very secretive about it. He didn't actually even allow Kepler to use the telescopes that right. he had built himself because he wanted to keep his monopoly going. Um, and likewise, I don't think that there'll be, you know, you'll be able to get a $25 LIGO uh, a replica or not replica an actual working ligo you know on, on amazon anytime soon but but uh but but uh you know we always talk about my late colleague here at uc san diego professor hans parr used to say that you know he was a european a dutchman <clears throat> worked with leon letterman and, and others in discovering uh, many fundamental particles that we know about today and uh, and he said that you know in his opinion general relativity was the culmination of western civilization and mm. that you know really to understand it to communicate it uh, all the meta skills plus all the actual physical skills and, and actually going into the detection of gravitational waves which are really the last remaining piece of 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 um, confirmation needed to Pastor, you know, to, to prove it to the extent that you can prove a scientific theory. <clears throat> and I think it's uh, it is wonderful to to think about well, what do people um, what do scientists do? I think we contribute to culture. And so mm -hmm. one of the ways that I uh, like to wrap up each podcast uh, that I have is to ask a guest uh, that's um, a question that is, you know, I've asked this to literally probably 50 people have been on the show, and that's uh, about creativity. Uh, because a lot of times we don't think about we think about writers we think about artists as creative and, and actors and act we don't think about scientists as creative 
And I wonder, you know, in your profession, you're not a scientist you know, professionally, but I'd say, you know, you've got pretty good street cred, you know, after writing all these wonderful books on science and, and, and instruments of science and the personalities within it, uh, you have way more than a lay person's exposure to it. Uh, but even outside of that, in your craft, in your field, um, you teach writing and, and, uh, and so forth, but can you teach creativity? Can you teach humans to be imaginative as our center here, UC uh, San Diego's Center for Human Imagination is named after Sir Arthur C. Clarke? Is that something that, in your opinion, can you teach creativity? And if so, how would you go about doing so? Well, you know, my, um, the course that I teach at Johns Hopkins, uh, I was invited to give a talk there a few years ago. And after the talk, the person who's running the program came up and asked if I would be interested in designing a course. And over the, over the years, I've been teaching it now for six or seven years um, in the spring semester. And it's called Science as Narrative. And I, uh, over, the, over the course of teaching it, I've found that the scientific method and writing narrative are very similar. And that's, uh, and that's really the major point of the class. Very briefly, uh, <clears throat> the scientist and the narrator basically ask three questions. It is, what do I know? What do I want to know? And what do I learn? And what you learn is usually some of what you wanted to know, but then there's a surprise in there. There's other information. And then you go back to the beginning and say, okay, now what do I know? Now what, what do I want to learn, et cetera? And that's how writers keep you engaged in a narrative throughout the book. Mm -hmm. Think about a movie. Every second of a movie is taking you a little bit farther along and creating more anticipation. And you know, part of the art of writing is to... Uh, create that curiosity in the reader and create the anticipation then reward it but not quite not not all the way until the end of of the project and the same thing is true of scientists they're asking themselves that question what do i know what do i want to know what do i learn and uh and so it is i think a very creative endeavor because you're trying to figure out how am i going to get answers out of the universe and how do i change my thinking so that i know that i'm asking the right questions uh, and um, and being aware of when you get the surprising answer and you know I mean here we're, we're, we've been talking about dark matter and dark energy neither of them was predicted uh, now we're talking about gravity you know we don't know what it is people aren't aware of that uh, you know again and again there are these surprises in science and I think that you need to have uh, you know a creative mind. I mean, I think that Einstein wrote wrote about this a lot. Mm -hmm. That that we um, that you that that you need to be able to have that intuition to be able to see something. I forget who who it was. I think it might have been Faraday who saw uh, an, an, an electrical event occurring in his mind before he ran the experiment yeah einstein with his thought experiment. thought experiments right yeah. you know right. i mean yeah. these are yeah um yeah. I, I i was uh i was talking with um adam reese recently who uh who won the nobel for his participation in the discovery of the evidence for dark energy uh and and he was and he started using a metaphor and i remembered years ago i was at I deliberately wanted to go behind the scenes at a press conference and see how the press conference is created, how the media uh, um, <laughs> is created, and uh, and I went down to um, to the uh, uh, to the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, mm -hmm. and uh, and I sat with Adam before the, the beginning of the press conference, and he was trying to describe something. I mean, he was using he was using a a metaphor. And then during the press conference, which was a, an audio conference, it was a dial-in conference. Uh, so there were just the people from the Institute sitting around the table uh, and fielding these questions and, uh, and so on. And Adam threw out a couple of metaphors in the course of the discussion. And as soon as the press conference was over, as soon as they cut the audio, everybody talked about which metaphors worked. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's very much, 
it's very much uh, a creative endeavor, I think. Indeed, yeah. Well, uh, I want to leave uh, audiences with that cliffhanger, and I use that word advisedly. And those of you who read Richard's phenomenal book, The Trouble with Gravity, will know why I left it uh, with that word cliffhanger, uh, because actually every chapter uh, uh, really uh, impels you to read more, and it's the sign and, of a and, of a and wonderful... I explain and I explain the origin the first time that's, that that, that that's what I yeah, in that's a novel what I, hanging from a cliff. That's what I'm hinting at, but now you oh, spoiled this. Okay, sorry. fine. <laughs> All right, right, we'll edit that out. No, it's it's fine. Um, yeah, I did delight in that description as well. Richard, thank you so much for sharing you. uh, your for valuable time me. with us. And uh, we'll let you know when this comes out. And uh, it's been Great. a pleasure talking to you. And I oh, hope we can meet in person someday so I can get your uh, signature on this hard copy. Thank you And so thank much. you for sending your book with the, uh, with the bit of uh, galactic dust in it. Oh, yes. That's a piece of space dust brought low by gravity yes that's right exactly well thank you so much richard okay. happy holidays happy 2020 you, and looking forward to talking to you again oh thanks you too the only thing we can be sure of about the future is that it will be absolutely fantastic five four three two one